So clearly, I don't need to introduce our next guest. Uh, it's not often that uh, a rock star welcome is reserved for a minister, but not surprising at all. We've seen this many, many times. Uh, uh, I have a picture that's very representative of the kind of applause we just heard, Dr. Jay Shankar. First of all, welcome to the India Today Conclave. Not only has this picture spawned a million memes, and you see it everywhere you go on social media, but you know, for a minister uh, whose every word social media hangs on to, uh, everything goes viral, it really doesn't hurt if you look like this. <laughs> because it just goes way, way wider. So I'm going to start with that image. Let's keep that image there because I, you know, not that people haven't seen it enough, but I want to keep that image on the screen. Dr. Jayashankar, it's not just a meme, it's not just an image. The things you say as India's external affairs minister resonate in the media, in, on social media. The things you say, apart from just your foreign policies and the th decisions you've taken, your images go viral as well. What does that virality mean to you, sir? How do you read that virality? It's not every day that you see this kind of thing. That's why I ask. Look, that's... That's a very unfair question to start with, <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, uh, I just try to be myself, and not always like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the point is today, if one, think about it, you know, to be India's foreign minister at a time when we are rising, uh, we are, if you use any metric, economy, influence, uh, all of that. Uh, and quite honestly, to be a foreign minister in a Modi government, you know, uh, it, it kind of sets your behavioral uh, approach. Does it, does it uh, uh, you know, are you aware that there is this large audience hanging on to everything that you're saying? and, you know, applauding all the things you say, oh, there's another Jay Shankar zinger. No, you know, no, he no, said no, something. No, no, 30 no, seconds, 30 no, seconds from a one-hour speech will just go crazy viral, millions of views. Yeah. Are you aware of that when no, you no, speak? I, I, I think you've got to keep it in proportion, okay? Uh, so, what, you know, actually, if you look at it, what has been happening is we've been putting out our narrative, our case, our arguments. And the world's been the last five years, unusually contentious and effervescent. You know, things are happening. Things are happening, people uh, make points strongly, and you end up in situations where you, you hold your ground or you contest it or you counter it or you... So it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's a product of circumstances. Product of times, I would say. Okay, come on, Shiv. Four decades in diplomacy, five years in uh, politics. Let's bring him into his comfort zone, China. So there's a massive challenge, but also opportunities. Uh, you have tried to manage the relationship with China. It's mm -hmm. been difficult, uh, not just for India, but across the world. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for the world today is China and the growing aggression of China in many parts of the world, not just in our region. How do you look at tackling China, handling China, and how do you see taking that challenge forward in uh, the next government should you win? Uh, look, I would say, uh, Gita, the first thing is we have to stop pretending that everything is nice, stop being uh, worried to express what we feel. Uh, stop using terminology which doesn't work for us. It may work for them. So I think being straight, being public, being upfront uh, is the starting point. Now, uh, the fact is, uh, it's not today or, I mean, I, I agree since 2020, the relationship has become much more complicated. I accept that. But it was building up over a period of time, you know. Uh, and what was happening was uh, because we weren't uh, uh, honest about it even to ourselves, 
uh, we weren't really uh, articulating it and frankly even strategizing uh, accordingly. You know, uh, I mean, there was a time when we actually said China is a strategic partner. I mean, if I were to today say this to anybody, people would be baffled. But yet, that was the official description at one point of time. So, the first thing is we've got to recognize today that we have uh, really, uh, in a way, a very challenging, competitive neighbor. Uh, there are serious issues over a period of time in our history. Many of those issues are, have not been resolved. Some have aggravated. Uh, it isn't just a boundary issue. Uh, there are, you know, we have common neighbors. We have a common periphery. There is competition there. Uh, there are very major economic issues that, and, and when you say what do we do, as I said, for a start, we've got to be honest about it, we've got to call out things when they go wrong, but we also need to prepare, you know, and the preparation, a lot of it has to be uh, the domestic preparation. I mean, if you are dealing with the China, you've got to have an economy which is, which is uh, geared up for it. Now, we have, for example, it's only in the last decade we have paid attention to manufacturing. Now, because of the neglect of manufacturing, we, you know, we started our economic reforms 30 years ago, but we didn't take it into the manufacturing world. So we have these uh, you know, uh, vulnerabilities or these gaps uh, which uh, make, it very, uh, you know, uh, make it very challenging to compete. So we've got to get all those things uh, right. So, you have to diagnose it, you've got to prepare for it, and then you have to express it and you have to manage it because you also don't want it, to, you know, uh, sort of going completely uh, awry. Dr. Jashankar, just to push the China question uh, a step further, uh, it'll soon be four years, like you, like you said, from 2020, things have, uh, have gone south. Uh, the military standoff turns four in just a few weeks from now, sir. Uh, can you tell, uh, you know, there have been many rounds of military level talks uh, and it appears, it has appeared for a while now that the reality is that the, uh, you know, a resolution of this entire thing is going to have to be diplomatic. Can you tell us how the next government will resolve this? Sir? Because it's a big military standoff that's been on for four years now. Well, uh, uh, I would say the, the scenario that I, uh, I can foresee has been that, uh, we, you know, they have uh, today massed a very large number of troops along the LAC. So have we as a counter deployment. Uh, the resulting situation, uh, uh, and you saw that, uh, you know, in a way, unfortunately, go wrong in Galwan, uh, is when troops are very close up. Uh, there are all the uh, dangers you associate uh, with that. Uh, so the focus in the military discussions has been uh, really about uh, uh, disengagement so that very close up uh, deployment of troops. Because remember, both of us are very forward deployed. This is not where, you know, in the last many decades was our natural uh, deployment. Uh, so how do we resolve that, how do we do it in a f manner in which uh, it works for both of us. There are issues related to patrolling uh, because, uh, you know, when you are deployed that close up, then there are patrolling issues, obstruction issues, uh, the workaround issues, uh, all of which uh, adds to a very complicated matrix. Uh, thereafter, there is, a, uh, there is a next round of issues, which is really what you would call de-escalation, which is the fact that both sides, uh, we as, as a reactive posture, uh, have brought very large number of troops with weaponry very, very close up. Uh, so I think there's, there's a lot to it uh, and, and uh, clearly it is something where, where we have to be both uh, patient but also very persevering. Okay, um, let's zoom out a little. We are yet to solve 
tensions uh, in our own region, but India is indeed playing a key role as peacemaker in other parts of the world, a major role when it comes to how uh, the world is looking to India uh, for mediation. Russia, Ukraine, the situation there, Israel, Hamas war, the situation there. But a very specific question, Dr. Jayashankar, there was a report uh, which said that the United States of America looked to India, as also China, and that Prime Minister Modi did avert a nuclear attack by Russia. Will you confirm? Uh, look, we have, since the uh, conflict in Ukraine started, uh, there have been a number of issues in which we have been involved. Uh, we haven't uh, been very public and explicit about all of them. Uh, in many cases, uh, one or the other party or a third party or an international organization has asked us to uh, weigh in in some form. Uh, and uh, if we believe that uh, uh, doing so was helpful, because, you know, ideally at this time, I mean, I, I would say, frankly, the world wants this conflict to end. But it's not something that anybody is expecting in the near term, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so the uh, most sensible thing to do is to say, okay, let me at least uh, help to solve one part of a problem or reduce one tension or relieve one worry. Uh, so there are, there have been a lot of these situations, uh, m quite honestly, more than you probably know. Uh, and. Uh, including sometimes fairly recent ones. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we do what a responsible country which, uh, which, is, which has good relations with everybody uh, does. But did he weigh in on a nuclear attack? Did he weigh in? Did, was there a conversation? Uh, as I said, we have been uh, continuously doing, con you know, doing whatever we can to, to reduce tensions, to relieve worries, to uh, see that things don't happen which make it worse. I can tell you, it's not a, you can't take the diplomat out of Dr. Jayashankar. Uh, yeah, you're not going to get him to say we averted a nuclear attack. Okay, let's, let's move from Russia, Ukraine now to the, uh, the Indian Ocean, Dr. Jayashankar, where, uh, you know, with the Red Sea, with the fallout of what's happened uh, between Israel and Gaza, uh, there's been a very positive spotlight on India and its role uh, in the Arabian Sea, in the Indian Ocean. We're also seeing... Uh, you know, an elevated level of aggression from the Chinese, whether it is in Maldives, whether it is elsewhere, uh, as far as its own intentions as far as the Indian Ocean are concerned. Can you tell us how India is navigating this? It's a complex, shape-shifting issue. Uh, can you tell us how the next government will handle this? This is a situation that is likely to become a bigger churn, sir. Well, look, uh, I think there are multiple things uh, which are happening in the Indian Ocean. Uh, one part of it, as you referred to, which is Red Sea, yeah. Gulf of Aden, etc. They, we are, uh, in fact, right now, we have an ongoing situation with one of our ships, uh, uh, INS Calcutta. Uh, so, uh, we are, you know, again, as a responsible country, uh, contributing our bit for maritime safety, security, uh, dealing with the, uh, you know, uh, prospect of drone and missile attacks on shipping, uh, countering piracy. And uh, this is important for people in our country to, to recognize and appreciate because the era when the global commons would be looked after by other people, that era is now behind us. So uh, countries like us have to be, have to weigh in more, be more active, uh, to use our forces uh, for, for common good, uh, in a way, and the Red Sea, Gulf of Aden uh, deployment. We have, I think, about 12 ships there. So if you look in terms of national commitment, we would be among the larger national presence, uh, uh, not the largest, but among the larger national presence out there. The second part of it uh, would be, uh, again, if you've seen the last 10 years, we've been very active as a first responder. Uh, that when you have natural disasters, you know, it was the Yemen civil war, uh, it was uh, going back to 2015, a water crisis in Maldives, a landslide in Sri Lanka, a cyclone in Myanmar, 
so where again we now I contrast that you know with say uh, two decades ago where again when we had the tsunami in 2004 essentially uh, apart from India really much of the uh, succor and support came from outside uh, forces in a way so we have to see it could be a, a conflict kind of situation it could be a natural disaster but our responsibilities and our activities in the region have actually grown tremendously uh, in the last uh, decade. The other part of it is the strategic part of it, you know, which is the natural contestation between states, uh, the competition out there, countries, you know, maneuvering, out maneuvering, countering, exerting influence, countering that influence. That is something which is which is part of the competitive nature of world uh, politics. Now. Uh, there will be ups and downs, uh, that is also to be expected. Often, uh, you know, political developments in one or the other country can, can uh, impact it. Uh, I mean, looking back, perhaps we should have been strategically much more aware than we were. Uh, so, uh, for example, you know, when Hamban Tota was first built, I don't think there was sufficient understanding in this country. We are talking 2008, 9, 10, you know, roughly that period, uh, about the, the uh, implications that it would have for a country like India. Uh, so uh, we are today very aware, uh, we are very active. Uh, uh, if you look, actually, you know, I'm giving you a kind of a bureaucratic uh, MEA speak uh, explanation. But you know, when we actually had a strategy called Sagar, the whole idea of Sagar is end-to-end -end look at the ocean as a consolidated space. It could be island states, it could be the oceans, it could be a regional effort. Uh, don't deal with it in bits and pieces and uh, be aware of your strategic interests and do what you have to do to, to safeguard it. So uh, these are all, look, uh, there's no end to it. I mean, uh, this is a permanent uh, in, uh, objective uh, of, of a country for whom an ocean space that is so proximate to it and where we have such a central spacing. Uh, we will have to be continuously and persistently active out there. There's also a concern, Dr. Jashankar, when it comes to social media, how, uh, how foreign policy is decided, not decided in the social media space today. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes we have uh, false narratives, narratives being built in that space. How do you look at that? How does one counter that in a, at a time when you have biases coming in, various countries have their own perspectives, uh, there's hypocrisy in how they see India's position on certain matters that don't, don't suit their interests? How does one challenge and beat this? Well, look, I am paid to fix foreign policy. I'm not paid to fix social media. <laughs> Uh, I mean, no, to be honest, nobody can fix social media. I mean, the nature of the platform is such that everything which you somewhat disapprovingly state uh, is actually something which gets uh, more eyeballs in social media. But what about so, the biases from international uh, it will, it papers, will happen. I take it as a countries. given. Look, I, I may not like it, but because I don't like it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I assume this is a, a, a medium which is uh, very angular, uh, where, you know, which is very naturally given to strong views, where the sense of being responsible for what you are posting is somewhat diminished. These are the facts of life with which we operate. But so you counter it uh, fairly rapidly. So the days when, let us say, the, uh, the XP division of MEA could sit over something for a few hours or a day, etc., those are behind us. I mean, on the run, I mean, sometimes we see a tweet, I mean, we counter it, frankly, sometimes within minutes. But Dr. Jayashankar, you say you're here to fix uh, foreign policy and not social media, but that's a constant side effect. Do you see that as, uh, you know, a, a kind of affirmation from millions of people who are listening to you as, uh, you know, Dr. Jayashankar, the External Affairs Ministry, you know, busting narratives that have prevailed for a long time against India, you know, we've seen this often, uh, uh, you know, especially when you're abroad, uh, you know, when Western journalists have asked you questions, you have had answers that have, you know, gone especially viral because it seems to bust a certain narrative. Also, the language of MEA has changed quite a bit, significantly so, it has. Well, look, we've adjusted to the times too. 
you know, I mean, as I said, it's a reality. So, if it is a reality and it's a medium where short, sharp, impactful expressions are required, then we sort of, uh, shall I say, move out of our old comfort zone and uh, adjust ourselves to respond uh, uh, in that way. I mean, we would change and it is actually happening. I, I, I see the point. But, I, you know, since I cannot change the nature of social media, I have to uh, communicate, uh, ideally at least uh, recognizing it, but if, if I could actually even utilizing it so that I can also get ahead in the game by saying the right things in the right way. So what's your short, uh, sharp, short, insightful reaction to the elections in Pakistan? In 30 seconds. Uh, does silence count? <laughs> so. Okay, I, I hope you're not going to be silent for the other election that I'm going to ask you about, which is the U.S. election. We'll come to the other election right at the end, but the U.S. election, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, uh, also this year, uh, also a very interesting one to watch. The Republicans, the Democrats, Biden, Trump. Uh, give us an inside view of how a system prepares for this kind of thing. You know, good relations with the Biden administration, with Trump as well before that. Uh, how, how does the system here prepare for this? You know, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting in, in two or three ways. Uh, one, uh, because we are not part of an alliance system. Uh, we don't have all the consequential issues that come out of it, okay? Because if you look today at the world and, uh, you know, you listen in, I was in Munich, for example, at the security conference. So when I listened in to the, you know, the worries or the debates which people were having, a lot of it were actually the debates of the allies of America. And they were debating what could be the implications uh, if for the alliance, uh, if uh, results go one way or, or the other. The second, which is uh, in a way peculiarly us, was, uh, you know, we had a very difficult time in our America relationship in the 1960s, definitely 70s, 80s. So what happened was because our challenges were more with the administration. Uh, we actually uh, concentrated on the Congress as a way of engaging the American polity. So over a period of time, and you know, this is an account I've been involved with for 40 years, we actually, uh, the Indian system developed this very bipartisan way of working, of casting its net wide, so the moment anybody actually pops up on the American political scene, uh, immediately what we do is to say, okay, that could be a governor today, could be a uh, you know, first time member of Congress. You try and reach out. So it's one place where we have actually built a very, uh, very, I would say, extensive culture of engaging and, and uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, re, you know, maintaining relationships. Now, when you take that into today's America, let us say last 10 years or so, for us it's very natural, I mean, I'm, I'm not disclosing any great secret, that say, before the 20, well before the 2016 November results, we had already reached out to the Trump campaign at, uh, I mean, at a high level, uh, yeah. and because that's the way it would be. And it wouldn't be, you know, uh, hypothetically tomorrow, let us say we are looking at the 20, uh, 28 election. Uh, if you have, because, you know, uh, presumably you will have different people there. It would, to me, it would be completely in order that if there were four or five candidates on each side, that we would have in each case, you know, mapped out the candidate, figured out who are the uh, influential advisor. This has become part of our, uh, I would say, uh, our America SOP. Uh, 
because uh, that relationship is uh, very important and to, uh, that is the only way you can actually get a grip on that relationship. Which is a long way of telling you that we are prepared for whatever happens. Yeah. Well, talking about relations with America, or for that matter, the Americas, um, we've had some concerns, um, the Indian side with uh, the American and the Canadian side when it comes to issues, uh, also with the Australian side. But the US ambassador from this very stage, uh, Dr. Jayashankar said, uh, when asked about these concerns about murder for hire charges, so on and so forth, that it has not created a bump in the relationship. Sorry, what has not created a bump? These murder for hire ah, charges okay. or the issues with regards to Gurpat Singh Panoon or Nijar, that it has not created a bump, but it certainly is something that they're going to follow through. How is India then really looking at uh, the concerns that it has raised? and the concerns that U.S. and Canada now have with India? No, look, you keep using U.S. and Canada sort of seamlessly. I would draw, Make the divide because I, we see I would how draw you react. a line there uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, most notably that uh, all said and done, uh, American politics has not given that kind of space uh, to, uh, you know, uh, violent extremist uh, uh, views and activities which Canada has done. So I, I don't think it's fair to the United States uh, to, to lump them together. I, w I would distinguish uh, between the two. Uh, in terms of how are we dealing with it, well, we're dealing with it this way, that uh, yes, the U.S. has shared with us uh, some information, some of it is in the public domain, so you are presumably familiar with it. Some of it is not. Uh, and uh, our uh, interest is to also look into it uh, because, uh, you know, uh, to us, uh, there seems to be a very strong organized crime aspect to it, which also impinges on our own security. Uh, so. Uh, when we were apprised of this information, we decided uh, to set up a very high-powered uh, uh, committee to look of, of competent people uh, to, to look into it, and that is an ongoing issue right now. Who's and the part Americans of that committee, know. sir? Sorry? Who's part of that committee? Because high, high uh, competent, high-level people. <laughs> sir. Okay, but can I just add and ask her, because uh, again, from this very same stage, U.S. Ambassador uh, Eric Garcetti also spoke about the other concern that now U.S. has raised and India said do not interfere in India's internal matters. That's the implementation of CAA. And he said that irrespective, we, have, we share certain values. We have certain values. You can question our imperfect democracy, and we also will continue to monitor and do so with regards to India. Uh, the fact that the cutoff date is 2014 and the, the people who have already come in are already in. Now, if we are looking at only Hindus, Sikhs, uh, Parsis, uh, Christians, and not Muslims, is it that not discriminatory? Is what maybe the West is looking at? So how do you look at the Western view or how the West is looking at the implementation of CAA? Well, look, I'm not questioning uh, the... Uh, perf imperfections or otherwise of their democracy or their principles or lack of it. I'm questioning their understanding of our history. Okay. I mean, if you hear the comments from uh, many parts of the world, it is as though the partition of India never happened. You know, and that there were no consequential problems which the CIA is supposed to address. So, if you d take a problem, remove all the historical context from it, sanitize it and make it into a political correctness argument and say, oh, I have principles and don't you have principles? I have principles too. And one of my principles is obligation to people who were let down at the time of partition. And I think the Home Minister spoke very eloquently on it yesterday. So, the second is, I also have a problem when people don't hold up a mirror to their own policies. You know. So, if you 
say, oh, uh, you are picking some faiths and not some other faiths. Okay, I'll give you a few examples of it. You know, have you heard of something called the Jackson, uh, Vanik Jackson Amendment, which is about the Jews from Soviet Union? So you would ask yourself, why only Jews? Then there was the Lautenberg Amendment, which was about Christians and Jews, again, 1989, Soviet Union. Uh, there was the Specter Amendment, which was a few years later, uh, which was about Baha'is. It was about, there was a, there was a law which was about a particular uh, uh, ethnicity from Vietnam who were fast-tracked for citizenship because they had uh, uh, fought alongside the Americans. There was fast-tracking of Hungarians after the Hungarian Revolution. There was fast-tracking of the Cubans in the 1960s. So if you were to ask me, have other countries, other democracies, fast-tracked on the basis of ethnicity, faith, social attributes, I can give you any number of examples. Now, if I were to also say, you know, after all, why is the situation important? Because very often, when you have something very, uh, you know, very cataclysmic, something really very major, it's not possible to deal with all the consequences right then and there. And I think, again, yesterday, Amit Bhai explained that, that the leadership of this country had promised to these minorities that if, you know, if you have a problem, you are welcome to come to India. The leadership didn't thereafter deliver on that promise. Now, it's not just our predicament. You know, if you look in Europe, many European countries fast-tracked uh, the citizenship of people who are left behind in the World War, or in some cases, much before the World War. Some historical issue which was not addressed, but you said, I have a moral obligation to that community. So the world is full of examples. And to me, the context is therefore very important. We're out of time, but uh, our audiences would be uh, quite upset with me if I didn't end by asking you a question that they've all asked me to ask you, Dr. Jayashankar, which is, uh, we have our own election coming up very soon. And they all want to know, are we going to see candidate Jay Shankar fighting the Lok Sabha election? That is not a question you should ask me, and I suspect it's not a question you're going to ask the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. S. Jay Shankar, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir.